Now, here I was, a young boy with a white mom, a black father, raised in Indonesia and Hawaii. And I was beginning to sense how fitting in to the world might not be as simple as it might seem. And so to see this man, this senator, this powerful, accomplished person who was not a central caster when it came to what you'd think a senator might look like at the time. And the way he commanded the respect of an entire nation. I think it hinted to me what might be possible in my own life. This was a man who, as a teenager, stepped up to serve his country even after his fellow Japanese Americans were declared enemy aliens. A man who believed in America even when its government didn't necessarily believe in him. That meant something to me. It gave me a powerful sense, one that I couldn't put into words, a powerful sense of hope. And as I watched those hearings, listening to Danny ask all those piercing questions night after night, I learned something else. I, I learned how our democracy was supposed to work. Our government of and by and for the people. That we have a system of government where nobody's above the law, where we have an obligation to hold each other accountable, from the average citizen to the most powerful of leaders. Because these things that we stand for, these ideals that we hold dear, are bigger than any one person or party or politician. And somehow nobody communicated that more effectively than Danny Inouye. You, you got a sense, as Joe mentioned, of just a fundamental integrity. That he was a proud Democrat, but most importantly, he was a proud American. Now, were it not for those two insights planted in my head, at the age of 11, in between Disneyland and a trip to Yellowstone, I might never have considered a career in public service. I might not be standing here today. I think it's fair to say that Danny Inouye was perhaps my earliest political inspiration. And then for me to have the privilege of serving with him, to be elected to the United States Senate and arrive, and one of my first visits is to go to his office and for him to greet me as a colleague and, and, and treat me with the same respect that he treated everybody he met, and to sit me down and give me advice about how the Senate worked, and then regale me with some stories uh, about wartime and his recovery, stories full of humor, never, never bitterness, never boastfulness. Just matter of fact, some of them, I must admit, a little uh, off-color. I couldn't probably repeat them in the cathedral. <laughs> There's a side of Danny that, oh, well. Danny once told his son that his service to this country had been for the children. For all the sons and daughters who deserve to grow up in a nation that never questioned their patriotism. This is my country, he said. Many of us have fought hard for the right to say that. And obviously, Rick Shinseki described what it meant for 
Japanese Americans. But my point is, is that when he referred to our sons and daughters, he wasn't just talking about Japanese Americans. He was talking about all of us. He was talking about those who serve today who might have been excluded in the past. He's talking about me. That's who Danny was. For him, freedom and dignity were not abstractions. They were values that he had bled for, ideas he had sacrificed for, rights he understood as only someone can who has had them threatened, had them taken away. The valor that earned him our nation's highest military direct, uh, decoration. A story so incredible that when you actually read the accounts, you think this, this, you couldn't make this up. It's like out of an action movie. That valor was so rooted in a deep and abiding love of this country. And he believed, as we say in Hawaii, that we're a single ohana, that we're one family. And he devoted his life to making that family strong. And after experiencing the horror of war himself, Danny also felt a profound connection to those who followed. It wasn't unusual for him to take time out of his busy schedule to sit down with a veteran or a fellow amputee, trading stories, telling jokes, two heroes generations apart, sharing an unspoken bond that was forged in battle and tempered in peace. In no small measure, because of Danny's service, our military is and will always remain the best in the world. And we recognize our sacred obligation to give our veterans the care they deserve. Of course, Danny didn't always take credit for the difference he made. Ever humble, one of the only landmarks that bear his name is a Marine Corps mess hall in Hawaii. And when someone asked him how he wanted to be remembered, Danny said, I represented the people of Hawaii and this nation honestly and to the best of my ability. I think I did okay. Danny, you are more than okay. You are extraordinary. It's been mentioned that Danny ended his convention speech in Chicago in 1968 with the word aloha. To so he said, but to others it may have meant goodbye. Those of us who've been privileged to live in Hawaii understand aloha means I love you. I know that he embodied the very best of that spirit, the very best of aloha. It's fitting it was the last word that Danny spoke on this earth. He may have been saying goodbye to us. Maybe he was saying hello to someone waiting on the other side. But it was a final expression, most of all, of his love for the family and friends that he cared so much about, for the men and women he was honored to serve with, for the country that held such a special place in his heart. And so we remember a man who inspired all of us with his courage and moved us yeah. with his compassion, that inspired us with his integrity, and who taught so many of us, including a young boy growing up in Hawaii, that America has a place for everyone. May God bless Daniel Noy, and may God grant us more souls like his.